honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining me tonight at a, a location that is closely related to art, but on a topic that's not easy to discuss. It's not easy to discuss because of where we are. Not easy because it involves Switzerland, along with the rest of Europe, which has based its post-war success on upholding the law, following the rules, and moving on from the horrors of World War II. And it's certainly not easy because a crime committed 80 years ago continues to stain the world of art today. I must confess, this talk is unusual for me. Although I've been working on the problem of art restitution for more than a quarter of a century, since 1990, <clears throat> I've only spoken about this topic in public once before. That's because I always felt that art restitution should be done quietly. Tonight is different for two reasons. First, because of the Gurlitt collection. And second, because this collection is coming to Switzerland. Everyone in the art world, and probably everyone in this room, was surprised by the discovery of the Gertlitt collection in Munich two years ago. We all suspected that much of this art was probably stolen from Jews because Cornelius Gertlitt was the son of Hildebrand Gertlitt, one of Hitler's personal appointed art dealers. Over a thousand works of art just don't show up in someone's home, especially someone who never seemed to work a day in his life. But my surprise turned to shock when I learned that the collection was to go to one of the world's great museums, the Fine Arts Museum in Bern. This made absolutely no sense to me. Why in the world would the Bern Museum want to get anywhere near a collection that part was probably stolen from Jewish homes by the Nazis? You already heard Mr. Wint Mr. Winter explain his disappointment that after two years of investigation, a German government task force that determined only five pieces were wrongly taken from Jewish owners. The reason for this, I believe, is very simple. The works of art in the Gertlitt collection were mainly drawings and prints. There were very few paintings. The Nazis kept excellent records of the art they stole. The paintings and sculpture were well documented, but all the rest were usually categorized simply as 10 drawings or five prints, nothing specific, making these words, these works of art hard to trace. So why, I wondered, would a museum want these works that may well have been stolen from Jewish homes? People even want to go and see these pieces. If it had been called the Heinrich Himmler collection instead of the Hildebrand Gertler collection, would any museum even want these works of art? That may sound harsh, but in terms of stolen art, there really isn't any much difference between Gertler and Himmler. Hildebrand Gertlitt, along with Alfred Rosenberg, 
Karl Haberstark, and Kayatan Mullmann were all directly part of the Nazi machine. All four of these men were chosen out of Hitler to steal Europe's art. They told the Nazis which homes to go to for the best works of art. And once taken, they all knew this art could be resold. These four men, Gertlet, Rosenberg, Mullmann, and Haberstock, along with a few others, were given a license to steal and then sell the works of art owned by Jews. Although some of this art was labeled degenerate by the Nazis and taken from museums, much of it was simply taken from private homes. Hitler's art dealers are at the very center of the greatest theft in art history. And they all personally benefited from the suffering of others. That is why I make the comparison between Hildebrand Gertlitt and Heinrich Himmler. Because of the Burns decision to take Gertler's collection, I started to look at Switzerland's role in what many people now call lost art. Can we please, once and for all, stop using the term lost art? None of this art was lost. It was not lost the way you may lose your wallet, unless your wallet was taken by, at gunpoint by a robber. These words were taken from people's homes. They were robbed the way robbers take whatever they want. Lost art sanitized the crime. From now on, let's refer it to this real name, stolen art, not lost art. These works were stolen by Nazis, but they were also stolen by governments that looked the other way. There were museums that were all too willing to put these stolen paintings on their walls, and these museums should have known better. Let me point out the hard truths that no one likes to talk about here. Shortly after the Nazis took power, they introduced the Nuremberg Laws in 1935. These laws placed severe racial restrictions on Jews. Jews were no longer allowed to be citizens of the Reich and they were denied basic political rights. 30,000 German Jews immediately lost their jobs in government, in, in universities, in corporations. Jewish doctors could not treat Aryan patients. Jews who owned newspapers, publishing houses, and department stores lost everything. That means they had to sell their possessions in order to survive. Everyone knew that the Nuremberg Laws forced Jews to sell their furniture, their rugs, their paintings, everything on 5% of what it was worth. That is why today, Raubkunst and Fluggut must be treated in the same way. The little English translation for Raubkunst is Nazi plunder or Nazi looted art whereas Flutgut deals with art and other items that Jews were forced to sell at low prices in order to survive. But could it make any difference if a painting was taken off the wall by a Nazi or if his Jewish owner was forced to sell the same painting that would go to one of Hitler's art dealers for almost nothing? Is there any difference in the outcome for the victims' families? The Director of Federal Office of Culture, Madame Isabel Ch Chasso, stated in an interview last fall, and I quote, only Switzerland makes a distinction between Rabkunz and Flutgut. The term art losses that were caused by Nazi persecution would be much more precise. I fully agree with her. Rabkunz and Flutgut are indeed the same. But why isn't this the official policy? After the Nuremberg Laws, 
forced these sales. Many countries took advantage of it. And yes, they, that included America as well. But in the very center of, all, of it all, Switzerland quickly became the major center for Nazi stolen art. In 1937, Joseph Goebbels presented the famous and Art of the Kunst, the degenerate art show. The Nazis pulled paintings from museum walls by Jewish and modern artists that did not fit their taste. On the top of the list were the Expressionists, the Cubists, and Jewish artists like Marx Chagall. But German officials quickly realized these pieces could be sold for badly needed foreign currency money that could be used to finance their war effort. So many foreigners did not want to buy from them directly because it didn't look right. The Nazis just needed a middleman. They found the perfect middleman in a person like Theodor Fischer, one of Switzerland's foremost auctioneers and art dealers. In 1939, Fischer set up the Grand Hotel Auction, and he, where he lived in Lucerne, attracting some of the top art dealers, collectors, and museum directors. The 126 paintings on that block included Franz Marc, Three Wet Horses, Gauguin's Landscape with Tahiti with, Tahiti with Three Female Tigers, Picasso's The Harlequin, and works by Beckman, Heckel, and Kirchner. Everyone in the art world knew what these paintings were. Everyone knew the paintings came from and how they got there. And everyone knew why they were so cheap. In some cases, this entire pretense of this auction was so, so transparent, it was downright embarrassing. For his part, Fischer backed up the Nazi distaste for these artists with his own negative commentaries. One major collector, Marion Feichtenfeld, saw a painting, Cathedral of Bordeaux by Kokoschka, the same painting she had donated to the National Gallery in Berlin on the auction block. A large percentage of, the, of, these, were, of these works were purchased by Swiss art dealers collectors, and museums. The Nazis set up some rather complicated schemes to bypass the laws of propriety with Switzerland at the center of it. Many of the great art dealers and auction houses in Europe had closed during World War II, leaving neutral Switzerland to pick up everything else as Europe's main auction center. It was, in fact, not just convenient to be neutral in World War II, it was very lucrative as well. Make no mistake, Theodor Fischer and Switzerland were not alone. Much of Europe became a thriving market for stolen art. But as bad as all of this was, the story gets even worse. After the war and the unconditional defeat of the Nazis, Swiss banks, museums, and private collectors conveniently challenged the validity of anyone else who tried to retrieve Jewish property. Between 1933 and 1947, Theodor Fischer held 47 art auctions. So you see, it's quite clear that auctions of this art continued well after the war ended. However, it seems that Fischer had the Swiss courts on his side in a very strange decision in 1948, the Swiss federal court held that both Fischer and the arms merchant and art collector, Emil Burler, had acted in good faith in their purchases. But they were still told to return some of the, their art acquired during the war. Then the Swiss Federation actually reimbursed Fischer for the stolen art he was forced to return. It has been said 
that according to the Swiss, good faith is when one closes his eyes and disregards any information that could be troublesome. In 1997, I was asked to join the Volcker Commission that ordered Swiss banks. The commission learned how banks that are the foundation of this country use every possible tactic to keep the deposits made by desperate Jews before and during the war. After 1945, if an heir tried to ret retrieve funds deposited by a dead relative, the banks demanded proof, like official death certificates. How unfortunate that Auschwitz and Treblinka and Theresienstadt did not issue death certificates. We also know that bank vaults where Jews placed art and jewelry were open and looted because they failed to pay their fees. Unfortunately, an inventory of the contents of these boxes was difficult to obtain. We will never know what was in them and what was stolen. Mahatma Gandhi once said, and I quote, there is a higher court than the court of justice and that is the court of conscience. Conscience supersedes all other courts, end quote. Keep this quote in mind tonight as I talk about the art that was stolen from Jews by Nazi and remains stolen more than eight decades later. Yes, humanity seeks justice, but not just the justice the lawyers may give us. I'm talking about the justice of humanity and fairness. Here is something I believe strongly. In the back of all of your minds, you know what I'm saying is true. And you know these paintings should have been given back to the rightful owners. You know this because if you put yourself in their place, if something you cared deeply about was taken from you, you would want it back. Nazi crimes have always been quite clear, but for many people, and even major museums, when it comes to the question of art, stolen art, something strange happens. People seem to look the other way. We are told somehow stolen art is more complicated. Somehow its victims are not really victims. Somehow it's okay when world famous museums have Nazi lewd art on their walls. Somehow, if it's a public museum, the crime is cleansed. Some others say, let's leave stolen art to the courts, and the, co and the courts will provide justice based on law. Here's the problem with that. The laws were not drafted with a crime like the Holocaust in mind. Before 1945, no one could have imagined such a crime. Remember that concept that Gandhi called conscience. Keep listening to your conscience as I explain why this problem should have been solved decades ago and why individuals and museums and whole countries drag their feet so that there be no resolution. Some museums say they acquired these pictures legally or they didn't know. There are far too many examples of this, but two stand out for me. The Jaffe family owned a large art collection in East France. In 1943, the Vichy government held what they called a Jew auction, which meant that all their paintings were sold for almost nothing. They were then resold at market value, and the officials of the Vichy government put the money directly into their pockets. The collection eventually spread around the world, and one painting, Deadham from Langham, by John Constable, was purchased by an art dealer in Switzerland 
1946. The painting was finally located in 2006 with a fine art museum, Chaux de Fonds, in Switzerland, near the French border. The Jaffa family retrieved several other paintings from various countries because the ownership was quite clear. All institutions in these various countries cooperated except one, the Chaux de Fonds Museum in Switzerland. Here the museum suggested that since the claim was against the Vichy government, the family should go to France for the money. This decision, I believe, shows a troubling lack of shame. As of today, Dedham from Langham still hangs in the Fine Arts Museum in Chaux de Fonds. Remember the question of conscience? Do you think this is right? In another case, the Maya family of France lost his art collection in 1941 in a similar theft. In 1952, their painting, Shepherdess Bringing in Sheep by Camille Pizarro, was found in the possession of a prominent uh, Basel, Basel art dealer, Christophe Bernoulli. When the Maya family attempted to negotiate his restitution, Mr. Bernoulli said, I'll sell it back to you, but the full market price. Does that sound right to you? When the Maya family brought legal action against the dealer, the Basel court held that the Maya family could not get it back. Why? The court said the Mayas could not prove that Mr. Bernoulli purchased this painting in bad faith. Bad faith. Case closed. The painting resurfaced again 60 years later in 2012. In all places, the Fred Jones Museum at the University of Oklahoma where it was donated as a gift. The family continues to fight for the stolen painting, a painting that was really stolen twice. Herbert Winter mentioned the Washington Principles. Let me explain exactly how they came about. 18 years ago in 1998, Stuart Eisenstadt and I knew that one international standard was needed to govern all stolen art. We developed that standard, and it's called the Washington Principles. Switzerland has endorsed the Washington Principles. The major Swiss museums have endorsed the Washington Principles. Principles provide the standard when it comes to stolen art. Everybody who endorsed the Washington Principles commit to find fair and equitable solutions in cases of stolen art. I strongly believe that because Switzerland signed the Washington Principles, we can all work together and find a fair and equitable way to move forward. How does a country find fair and equitable solutions? I believe there are six essential requirements. First, stolen art must include all art losses caused by Nazi persecution. That's Rob Kunz and Fluchgut that I spoke about earlier. All these losses that were caused by the Nazis, and, and, and they were aided by local governments throughout Europe. Second, provenance research must be connected proactively. It's not right that the, victim, the victims have to prove that they own their paintings. The museums must be obligated to research their paintings. Third, sufficient funds must be provided for, for provenance research. Every country that endorsed the Washington Principles automatically makes the commitment to provide sufficient funds for this research. The director of the Federal Office of Culture has recently announced, you just heard, that an amount of 500,000 Swiss francs will be available for research this year and two million over the next four, year, four years. This is an important step. It shows that the Federal Office of Culture is committed to this task, and we thank them. The political decision must support not just public museums, but private collections and dealers with sufficient funding for providence research. Fourth, 
there must be complete transparency on all aspects of provenance research by means of a centralized internet database. A centralized database for issues in Switzerland should be open to all museums, collectors, art dealers, and historians to publish the results of the provenance. This will facilitate the search for stolen art. It will facilitate the exchange of information on stolen art, and it will help victims' families find the relevant information on stolen art. Fifth, an independent commission must be established. This commission will provide proposals for fair and equitable solutions in cases of lost art to museums and victims' families. Museums may have conflicts of interest when it comes to decisions on stolen art. This should be taken to an independent commission, and I urge the Swiss museums to create one now. And finally, the sixth point, that cannot be overlooked. Too often, auction houses receive pieces they know are stolen art, but they ignore it. The buyer comes along and spends a great deal of money in good faith that the auction, that the auction house did its due diligence. Many citizens in Switzerland purchase art in auction houses not knowing the background and have Jewish art stolen by Nazis on their walls today. We are now retrieving the records from auction houses over the past 20 years. So buyers will be able to check a database with history of anything they purchase. But honestly, I don't have an answer for someone who bought a painting in good faith 30 years ago and now finds it's a stolen piece of art. I do not, I do not know, I do know that in the case of the Bury Museum of Fine Arts, they are wrong. And the actions of many auction houses over the years are wrong as well. What we need to do is stop this from happening in the future. Why is this so urgent in 2016? Remember, for practically every piece of stolen art, a murder was committed. More than 70 years after the end of World War II and the Holocaust, an end to this problem is long overdue. I've laid out six essential requirements that would begin the process of putting these ghosts to rest once and for all. People have been told that determining the provenance, checking the history and ownership of a painting is a complicated process. That's not true. If they really want to solve this issue, if they have a conscience, then they should stop hiding behind excuses. I know everybody here wants to solve this problem. I believe all of Switzerland wants to close this chapter. Switzerland endorsed the Washington Principles. The Smith Museums endorsed the Washington Principles. That's a strong statement in favor of the victims of Nazi persecution. Switzerland has taken an important first step by providing money for research. This country, among all countries, should make sure this happens. Switzerland can now set the gold standard for finding fair and equitable solutions for stolen art. It is time, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot go back and change what has happened. All we can do now is stop the continuation of this crime. No one is telling an individual to give back what they purchased in good faith, but they should at least know the history of ownership of anything they have in their homes. And museums and auction houses must finally and completely have the responsibility to do the providence research on all of their work. Art historian Holger Klein had said, the ghosts have come back to haunt us, and they will continue to haunt us until there is restitution after more than 70 years. Don't you think it's time to put these ghosts to rest? I believe it's in time. Ladies and gentlemen, it is, in fact, long past time. Thank you for listening.